Today in World Literature, we turn to the final segment of our course as we look at the literature of Australia and Oceania. We begin with the study of Patrick White. While our focus here is on his novel, Vos, I will use this lecture to introduce the unique ways that the continent of Australia has shaped the fiction of its writers. Carolyn Bliss's work on Patrick White's fiction is quite good. In her book on Patrick White, she refers to Richard Campbell, who writes on religious belief in Australia. Campbell reminds us that the outback may quickly become internalized in Patrick White's fiction, and indeed in much of the fiction that we read when we read about Australia and New Zealand. Campbell writes, emptiness is not nothing. It is the uncanny limit of our self-assertion, a beyond an outback which indwells our existence, curbing any pretension to absolute knowledge or authority. This deep, inarticulate sense of limits is the correlative of the recognition of the contingency of our being in the world. Theologically, it means that the absence of God is not nothing. It is his particular mode of presence. It is indeed in this idea of emptiness the psychological, internalized construct of emptiness, perhaps even existentialism, if we might call it that, that we find in Australian literature, that we may better come to understand the role of Aboriginal culture in this literature. In this lecture, I'd like to look at that role in Patrick White's novel, Vos, in Judith Wright's poem, Bowering, in Catherine Pritchard's The Kubu, in Xavier Herbert's Capricornia, and in Colin Johnson's Dr. Woretti's prescription for enduring the end of the world, what I hope to be able to establish here is the different ways that these writers treat Aboriginal culture and the key and central role that Aboriginal culture plays in these pieces of literature. As we understand that, we may then be able to get a particular kind of insight into these works that we might not otherwise have. We may indeed remember um, in Patrick White's Vols that two characters, Duggald and Jackie, have particularly significant and important roles to play there. Duggald might be seen as, I suppose, the exemplar of the purely natural man in the novel. It is certainly Duggald that plays this role, I imagine, rather than Judd himself. It is Duggald who turns back to his own aboriginal culture, to his own tribe, preferring that, and the seasonal nomadic life of his culture rather than the civilized life of the city. But crucial, of course, in the novel Vos is the other Aboriginal guide, Jackie, because, because of course it is Jackie himself who kills Vos in the novel. And it is Jackie himself who, as it were, takes on the mark of Cain, who takes on Vos's personality and begins to wonder, confused, haunted even, in search of what he cannot find. I suppose that we might understand more about the role of Duggald and Jackie, these two aboriginal tribesmen in the novel, if we take a look at Judith Wright. In particular poem, Judith Wright writes this, Wounded, we cross the desert's emptiness and must be false to what would make us whole, for only change and distance shape us some new tremendous symbol of the soul. It is, I think, particularly significant to turn to Judith Wright, as Carolyn Bliss does in her book on Patrick White, to help us understand that over time and distance, humans must indeed be false to their wholeness, false to those things that they indeed find most certain and most secure, for it is only that, it is only the, the, the circumspection, the reflection on the limits to knowledge that indeed keep us searching, keep us moving forward keeps the, as it were, epistemology sharp and focused. It is indeed then by looking at our two Australian characters, Duggald and Jackie, that we can begin to understand that Vos himself tests his own European consciousness against the interior landscape of Australia and indeed finds the limits of certainty, the limits of knowledge, and the limits of that consciousness itself. Judith Wright celebrates Aboriginal culture and indeed in many ways mourns for its loss. She does this beautifully in a poem called Borrowing, a poem 
that takes up the plight of the Aboriginal people. The poem is brief and recalls reading. Judith Wright writes, The song is gone. The dance is secret with the dances in the earth. The ritual useless. The tribal story lost in an alien tale. Only the grass stands up to mark the dancing ring. The apple gums posture and mime a pass corrobore, murmur a broken chant. The hunter is gone. The spear is splintered underground. The painted bodies a dream. The world beneath sleeping and forgot. The nomad feet was still. Only the rider's heart halts at a sightless shadow, an unsaid word that fastens in the blood the ancient curse, the fear as old as Cain. The first three stanzas of the poem open up with a communal gathering, the choral boring of the Aborigines. Usually this gathering prepared them while they danced, sung, chanted for rituals that prepared them for hunting, for communal activities as a tribe. We note that Judith Wright is mourning the extinction of this particular ritual. We notice that in the particular language that she's using. There is the concrete, I suppose, the, the, the very explicit particular in the poem itself that describes the life of the Aboriginal people. Song, dance, ritual, story, hunter, spear. And we contrast that with the image that we have now. The nomad feet are still. There are things that are useless, splintered, forgotten, lost. It is also particularly significant to understand the final lines in the poem, the images of the rider's heart. The rider's heart here pretty clearly represents the white settler population. And in going forth into the landscape, the rider's heart becomes still. The rider carries the mark of Cain, the mark of Sin, the biblical character, of course, who kills his brother Abel and carries the mark of the murderer on his forehead. The rider's heart, the white settler's heart, therefore, freezes as he comes upon the boar ring, comes upon the circle itself, and realizes that it is he that is responsible for destroying this aboriginal culture, a culture in which individuals treaded lightly upon the land, a culture in which material goods were seen as superfluous, something unnecessary in the landscape, something unworthy to carry around. Of course, we know that European settlers strongly and profoundly misunderstood Aboriginal culture. But when we look at Wright's Boer Ring, we do get some sense, even though the poem is enormously sad, of the loss of this culture and the responsibility that the white settlers carry as they carry the mark of Cain for extinction a part of this culture. Catherine Pritchard also mourns the loss of Australian culture in a particularly harsh and striking short story, very well known, called the Kubu. Kubu is Australian term for infant or baby. In this story, we find two women characters, Rosie and Minnie. It is Rosie who is the center of interest here for Pritchard. In this early Australian bush story, we find that Rosie proceeds forward on a roundup, and we might here wind up with images in our own mind of American cattle ranching in the West. Rosie is caught between two worlds. She enjoys the cattle roundup that she's working with the white settler population, but is unable to do it freely, is unable to do it well. The reason is because she's carrying and nursing her kubu, her baby. And as the day progresses and she finds out that she is not able to do her writer's task as well as Minnie, Rosie becomes conflicted. She finally becomes angry and takes the child, takes it from her breast and dashes it, therefore killing the child. The final images of the story uh, certainly stay with us and bear reading. In the dawn, when a cry remote and anguish flew up through the clear air, but she wondered who was dead in the camp by the creek. She remembered how Rose had looked the night before when she asked about the Kubu. Now she knew the Kubu had died. Rosie was wailing for him in the dawn, cutting herself with stones until her body bled, screaming in the fury of her grief. 
this sad story is made even more complex when we realize that this idea of ranching or herding is not an activity that is intrinsic to Aboriginal people. It is indeed an activity that is brought by white settlers. And once we realize that, we realize the inescapable position that the Aboriginal culture is put in. They cannot succeed at the things they most love, their own culture, their own nomadic existence. The Europeans have interrupted that. Nor can they, ex nor can they succeed in what is certainly not a symbiotic relationship, but certainly an abusive relationship with the European oppressors because the European oppressors have introduced a culture that is foreign to them. And so it is that Rosie, although she enjoys uh, the roundup, the rustle, uh, cannot succeed in it because of her traditional role, and especially her role as a mother. Students will no doubt ask what we make of this particularly harsh piece. Is It seems quite clearly that it is a round condemnation of European culture a condemnation of a culture that is alien and invasive to Aboriginal people, a culture that does not allow Aboriginal people to succeed in any way, it is indeed, it seems to me as well, a story that talks about women's ways of knowing, if we can borrow that term. It's a story that is a particular kind of feminine consciousness. And it leads us to reflect pretty carefully on the roles of women in this culture, the roles of Aboriginal women, and how indeed the white population has made uh, something that is intrinsic and natural, the role of motherhood, something that is unnatural to the point where our character Rosie cannot bear it herself. We continue on um, in the mode of looking at these particular pieces of literature through um, an examination of Aboriginal culture with uh, an excerpt from the novel Capricornia by Xavier Herbert. This story is a story set in Queensland, I suppose we might call that, if there is, a tropical province of Australia, during a pioneering period when large amounts of land were given over to European settlers. The story is told through Oscar's point of view. Oscar is the owner of about uh, 600 or so square miles of an estate called Red Osha. He's a settler. He appreciates the land's wild beauty, although he's highly conflicted by its enormous range. At one time it uh, is parching hot, and at another time the rain is impassable. Into this story comes an Aboriginal child. The child's name is Nonum, and Nonum is the Aboriginal word for a dog that is unwanted, but that the culture is not willing to kill either. Nonum, we find, is the illegitimate son of Oscar's brother. Um, Nonum is certainly not accepted by the Aboriginal culture, nor is Nonum accepted by uh, Oscar. The story is an almost uh, much as much as we might look at at a condemnation that is implicit in Pritchard's *The Kubu*. The story by Xavier Herbert, the particular excerpt rather from *Capricornia*, is again a roundabout condemnation of the role that white settlers play in the oppression of. Australian culture, the child, Nonim, is not accepted by Oscar, nor is he accepted by Marigold, Oscar's 11-year-old uh, daughter, who is motherless. The child, of course, would like to play with the child who comes to visit, but is unable to. The father prevents that. It is only after some period of time that Oscar breaks down, and that indeed the child is allowed to play with his daughter. Oscar's love for his daughter, I imagine, and sort of his reluctant admission of family responsibility allows this to happen. The early rejection comes to some sort of acceptance at the end. Certainly, the novel, or the excerpt that we're reading here, is a roundabout condemnation of racism that exists. But it does give us, I think, more hope, more hope than we get in Pritchard's piece, more hope than we get in Wright's piece itself. It gives us a message that this sort of close living between the white settlers and the Aborigines may indeed be possible. And indeed there is, is at least the possibility of close interracial relations here, even though they are very reluctantly embarked upon. Certainly, Xavier Herbert does not paint a pretty or a complete picture here at the end of Capricornia, although he does give us the idea that it is possible to have relations between Aboriginal and the European settlers. Finally, 
we turn to Colin Johnson. Colin Johnson's piece uh, is from Dr. Woretti's prescription for enduring the end of the world. Colin Johnson is an Aboriginal writer. His Aboriginal name is Maguru Nyunga. Um, in this particular excerpt that we have, we have an enormous amount of humor. Um, if we could talk about, as we do quite frequently, the, the differences in humor or satire between Horatian and Juvenilian satire, Horatian satire being, of course, that more genteel satire, Juvenilian satire being that more biting satire, certainly we can see in this piece uh, sort of a combination of them both. Uh, certainly the condemnation and satire here is made, though, comically, humorously, more than it is biting or sort of invective. Um, we have here an aboriginal and colonial encounter. We have a missionary who comes into the situation, Mr. Robinson. And the missionary is seen as bizarre. The missionary is seen as bizarre by his own people. The missionary is seen as bizarre by the aboriginal counter that he, that, by the aboriginal people that he encounters, specifically the meeting between Rorreddy and Mr. Robinson, who was mocked by the convict crew, mocked by Rorreddy himself. Rorreddy, of course, resents Robinson's superior manner. His, he resents his jealousy. He resents his interest in aboriginal women, which is more than just saintly. More than, uh, more than, it reflects more than his, uh, his hope to convert them to Christian religion. The novel uh, certainly uh, is, is a criticism of naive uh, idea, ready acceptance of colonial protection, as if the Europeans were going to be able to bring that. Certainly, the narrative gives us an idea of British colonialism in Australia as being less than wholesome. Um, and that the role of the white man in this particular during period is, is, certainly, um, is, is certainly less than admirable. We might, on a more serious note, contrast this, or compare it rather, to poems such as Wright's Boring. But of course, the best comparison with Dr. Rorreddy's prescription of the end of the world is the one that comes to us most naturally, and that's the comparison with Robinson Crusoe by Defoe. In Crusoe, you'll remember, the uh, character is stranded on an, an abandoned island and it meets Friday and immediately puts Friday into his role as servant. Uh, quite different here when uh, Robinson Crusoe or the white settler is looked at through the eyes of Aboriginal culture. In that way, the novel by Johnson can also be compared to Patrick White's piece itself. It is important to understand in the pieces that we've looked at Patrick White's Vos, Judith Wright's Boa Ring, Catherine Pritchard's The Kubu, Xavier Herbert's Capricornia, and Mudvuru Nayoga's Dr. Woreddy's Prescription for Enduring the End of the World, that we can understand something very particular about literature of Australia by having a frame of reference that allows us to look very carefully at relations between the white settlers and Australian, by the relationship between the white settlers and Aboriginal people. It is, I think, very important to realize that the European settlers interrupted a very powerful, very rich, and very deep culture here. And that, as the European settlers were testing themselves against the Australian interior, internalizing in many ways that existential landscape, they themselves, quite clearly these writers are telling us, were being tested by their treatment of the Australian people. It is in this way that we can begin to understand something of the complexities of Australian literature and some of the comparisons that we can make between it and between the literature of Latin America and the Caribbean, the literature of North America and well. In all cases, white populations are in conflict with, it, with either indigenous peoples or peoples who have been brought there under suppression, under slavery. And in all of these cases, across the three continents, our writers, our contemporary writers, seem to want to have us look very carefully at these relationships so that we can understand, and this is the crucial point that we should end with, the limits of European tolerance, the limits of European morality, and the very richness of the Aboriginal people in this case, or the indigenous people in other cases. The Europeans' blindness to seeing this richness
and the dire consequences of that European blindness. White's characters, some humble, many heroic, are generally outcasts in their community. The exploration of the forbidding interiors, the encounter between aborigine and convict, the contrast between the untamed interior and the urban province, all are included in the novel Vos. As a novel of Australia, it is a story inspired by the geography as a continent. As a world of a novel, it is a story of existential anguish. Colin Johnson's Dr. Woreddy's prescription for enduring the end of the world, what I hope to be able to establish here is the different ways that these writers treat Aboriginal culture and the key and central role that Aboriginal culture plays in these pieces of literature. As we understand that, we may then be able to get a particular kind of insight into these works that we might not otherwise have. We may indeed remember um, in Patrick White's Vulse that two characters, Douglas and Jackie, have particular significant and important roles to play there, indeed in much of the fiction that we read when we read about Australia and New Zealand. Campbell writes, Emptiness is not nothing. It is the uncanny limit of our self-assertion, a beyond, an outback which indwells our existence, curbing any pretension to absolute knowledge or authority. This deep, an articulate sense of limits is the correlative of the recognition of the contingency of our being in the world. Theologically, it means that the absence of God is not nothing. It is his particular and Oceania. We begin with the study of Patrick White. While our focus here is on his novel Vos, I will use this lecture to introduce the unique ways that the continent of Australia has shaped the fiction of its writers. Carolyn Bliss's work on Patrick White's fiction is quite good. In her book on Patrick White, she refers to Richard Campbell, who writes on religious belief in Australia. Campbell reminds us that the outback may quickly become internalized in Patrick White's fiction and in the mode of presence. It is indeed in this idea of emptiness the psychological, internalized construct of emptiness, perhaps even existentialism, if we might call it that, that we find in Australian literature, that we may better come to understand the role of Aboriginal culture in this literature. In this lecture, I'd like to look at that role in Patrick White's novel, Vos, in Judith Wright's poem, Bowering, in Catherine Pritchard's The Kubu, in Xavier Herbert's Capricornia, Today in World Literature, we turn to the final segment of our course as we look at the literature of Australia.